many ways, the outcome of that discussion uh, with the advisors, with good advisors and friends we have there, but often it is the question uh, in the negotiation process when you can have really, uh, really have an impact on the, on the country. But now we are discussing today, and we will go into that, and our, well, the speakers will also do it, because we are going to concentrate uh, on Cambodia. And we know that there is the special, uh, let's say, we, we love abbreviations in the European Union, EBA, EBA, we are talking about EBA, everything but arms, which is uh, de facto a system that was, has been set, put in place to give trade preferences to countries provided they adhere to human rights norms. And uh, either Finn, uh, either, uh, I'm talking very, very friendly, we are, I hope that we will hear mere, more about these uh, conditions that have been put to Cambodia. But not going further into, into uh, this question, I want to introduce and ask my, my pa our panelists to come to the, uh, here up to the, po the uh, fine podium. Uh, there has been, as, as Thomas was saying, some changes, but first of all, Mu uh, Sokwa, where are you, Mu? You are here. <laughs> Our distinguished uh, panelist, uh, let me say, um, I'm representing uh, here the Liberal International and its Human Rights Committee. And can I say, uh, Mu, how long, how uh, an esteemed partner your party, your party's representatives have been to Liberal I I International. Uh, we know that uh, Sam Rainsy, who, who uh, is in exile since 2016, he has been a welcome and dear guest at Liberal International events. We have heard his and more your uh, compelling, touching, uh, appalling, even appalling counts of what ha what is going on uh, in in, Cambo in Cambodia. Uh, we have I don't know how many resolutions we have been fo forced to pa pass on the initiative of your party of your friends in in other other countries. We have submitted uh, resolutions uh, to the United Nations Human Rights Council. We have spoken to to people around that council to see what ca ca can happen. And we know the struggle you are now conducting. And I invite you, as vice president of, of, your, of your party, as leader of its female uh, uh, wing, we know you will tell more about what is happening now, what has happened to, because we know that the party you are representing, the Cambodia National Rescue Party, has also de facto, legally, so to say, uh, been uh, dissolved. You are, cannot operate as a, as a party uh, in Cambodia, and you have many people who are forced to exile, or you have, they have been, uh, they have, many people have been arrested, their elected positions have been taken from them, so on, so on. More, a warm applause to more, more and you will come to take the, the floor. Uh, we have, uh, uh, also, uh, we, we, it was the intention to, to have uh, Ilhan, uh, Ilhan Kuchuk from the now a, a present MEP to, te to introduce the, so to say, European position, meaning what, what has been the stand of the European Parliament, what is going on in, in, in other parts of the EU institutions. But un unfortunately, as Ilhan is a delegation leader, he had to, uh, and there is a vote in the group at nine o'clock now, so he had to go. But Phil Benyon, who until some days ago was an MEP, and we very much regret that you are not anymore, but Phil Benyon, who also <coughs> the vice chair of the Human Rights Committee of Ella, will replace. Please come here. And we are waiting for, for the journalist. Ernest Sagada will see what happens. But my suggestion is that move, that you, you start, because we need to hear the new facts, what is, what is now going, going on, what can we expect, uh, 
those of us who, who follow uh, the situation in, in, in your country know that uh, the EU Commission is expected, is expected to take a position very, very soon, uh, depending on the reports that the, uh, and, and the, uh, the facts that the, the, the government has, has produced. And there are maybe some things we don't know about what conditions has been, has, has been put. But what is the state of play? And above all, what do you wish the European decision makers to, to uh, what the kind of decision would you uh, prefer in this situation if there's something that we can do and, and lobby? But maybe also we will have then time to, to look into uh, other areas, other decisions maybe that are, are necessary to uh, in the United Nations or in other countries, in other regional organization. Uh, I think that uh, the, the life does not stop at next week. There will be a long struggle to, to continue. And once more, let me say, we stand with you. So, move. the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Astrid. It is quite an honor to be here again. Last night we were here, uh, full, full room as well. And we're talking about women in politics. Tonight is another hot, uh, very hot issue, democracy, human rights, and free trade. How does it work? Uh, thank you to Thomas, to FNF for hosting this very important uh, topic. It's going to be a debate. I hope it's a hot debate. Let's make it a hot debate so that it will be heard uh, in the parliament as well as in the commissions of the EU. It is very uh, important to us because we're talking about real, real lives. And it is here at the Frederick, Frederick uh, Norman Foundation, the place to be talking about and to be hosted by Legal International as well as by FNF, who uh, we stand no values or our values, but the values that put our people, especially our women, our, our workers, our farmers, uh, in a place where they can feel uh, they, they, that they put real values into local economy, uh, national economy, economy, global economy. So I am going to start by also um, acknowledging my countrymen and women in the back who, who came to join me from some they are Cambodian Europeans coming from all over. After, after, after this, we are going to hold a rally uh, nearby. Is it that everyone understands English? No, no. Yana, no, no. Is it that Chloe is not here? No, no, she is not here. How are we going to do it with this? No, but is there someone who can sit in front of those who do not understand English? Michael, you can help translate. Can you help yeah. translate? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, if you sit in front of each other, we take a little bit of this. Because I think it's very important that everyone understands what we're saying. But we were not prepared for the translation. But you told me that we have a little bit of trouble. Before I get into the debate, I would need to give you a, a, a very short background, as short as possible, how we got to where we are today. The situation, political situation, economic situation, human rights situation in Cambodia. Uh, I'm going to cut it down by starting from 2012, the date, 2012, the year. It is an important year because it is the year when two human rights, democracy um, group opposition merged into one party, 
the Cambodia National Rescue Party, CNRP. If you forget anything from, from the, during the day, don't forget Cambodia National Rescue Party, CNRP, the only opposition in Cambodia, okay? CNRP. So in 2012, two big, two opposition uh, parties merged into one party, the CNRP, the Cambodia National Rescue Party. It became it's such a signature. It was really what the people of Cambodia wanted. They wanted pro, 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 change, change, change. And the leaders of the two opposition parties understood that they had to merge and became one, CNRP. We were, I'm part of CNRP now, uh, we were uh, ratified by the votes, the confidence that the voters gave us in the election of 2013. We got over 43% of the votes, about over 3 million votes. The ruling party that has ruled Cambodia for over 33 years, former Khmer Rouge, former uh, communist, still communist as far as we are concerned, um, got 44%. We got 43 plus percent. See how close we came. Even then, in 2013, we contested the results of the election because we won the 2013 elections. It was manipulated, but nevertheless, okay, for the sake of democracy, we accepted to be the grand opposition in the parliament of Cambodia, 2013, okay? Remember, these dates are important. Numbers are important. Mm -hmm. Numbers are Numbers are important, <laughs> yeah. 2017, fast forward, four years later, local elections, 2017, local elections, CNRP broke the ground, broke the stronghold of CPP, the Communist Party, the former Communist Party. To the most remote areas, we had represent. We won the commune level at the commune level. The chiefs of communes, the most even in the jungle of Cambodia, we won those seats. Those were the stronghold of the Khmer Rouge. You know, Khmer Rouge killed close to two million Cambodians, including my parents. We are here because of the genocide in Cambodia. So, 2017, we got. 5,007 seats at local level. They used, to, they, used, they used to say, oh, opposition, you only get the big town, the big cities. This time, we even got the remote villages. 5,007 seats. The next election, national election, would be 2018, a year. 2017, 2018. Hun Sen started to freak out. Then he set up this scenario. He knew that if he had allowed us, the CNRP, to compete for election in 2018, we would have not just won landslide, won by landslide. Because that chant for pro, pro, pro was so, so much part of every, every Cambodian. Even a child would come up and say pro, pro, pro because that child knows that he or she need, want an education. Yeah, don't want to grow up and be a migrant worker in Thailand or a illegal migrant worker or be trafficked in, into prostitution. They didn't know that, they want to change. Then Hun Sen knew that if he had allowed us to compete in 2018, we would have won landslide by landslide. So he set up a scenario in 2017 after the results of the local elections. He started his scenario, the result was to be to run by himself without us. So he had to make a plan. His plan was first putting human rights defenders 
in jail, human rights activists, environmental activists, anybody that had a kind of a, a free mind in jail. Okay? He succeeded. In a, that 2017, the beginning. Then it came to us. He amended law, uh, political law, uh, party laws to the point where he was able to, dis to put our president in jail and dissolve the party. So 16 November 2017, 3 September 2017, our president was put in jail, was in, I mean, house arrest for two years. Today, he goes to court every day. And the charge is treason. The first president, Mr. Samansi, that Astrid mentioned, and a friend, a very good friend of Ally, had an award from Ally uh, for freedom, had to be in self-exile, Mr. Sam Lang -Si. So cut it short again. Here we are. I am in exile. Many of us are in exile. I will show some, a, a, some images later of the youth of, uh, in exile. In Cambodia, our members are in hiding or have to were forced to defect, but only less than 10% were forced to defect. They were tortured, they are being tortured, they had to flee. This is the situation in Cambodia. It's not a party targeting the opposition, but any single opposing voice to Hun Sen. Hun Sen is now counting on China, totally counting on China, Today, an article from ABC uh, Australia just confirmed that China, again confirmed and confirmed that China has a military base in Cambodia, not in one place, but in two places that would control the, uh, the maritime um, channel. channel yeah. yeah, very key to, uh, for uh, Southeast Asia, for the ASEAN. So this is not just, a issue for Cambodia is an issue for ASEAN, is a global issue. Now, EBA, as we yeah, mentioned, yeah. EBA, I will be quick and will, will you be yeah, yeah, mentioning yeah, EBA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will only cover the situation, the political situation in Cambodia to put in that context and, and then um, feel yeah. you be talking yeah. about EBA. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I, I think it's very good that, that we, we do with that because you will you will tell about about it. I just also uh, just as an as an example, I think that some of us met uh, in Geneva in September two thousand seventeen, just after Kim Soka had been, been arrested. Liberal International was then at the Human Rights Council making making and trying uh, a statement. On, on the on the situation, and let me also we, we intended to to, uh, to have I hope we will get the journalists also. But as you more mentioned, uh, you have the let's say the repression of, of, of there is no free media no. in the country anymore. There is violation of, of labor labor rights, ILO convention, and we have also the situation as you mentioned land grabbing. And uh, I, have un I have unfortunately only once been in your country. But already then people told how dangerous it was if you went into checking what is the situation with, with logging. Much, much illegal yeah. logging. And I think we, we, we here in the part where we are consumers of some, you know, we need to know also about what should we do with, with that? But I give the floor now to, to, to you. Will, you will tell us, Phil, what is behind this EBA? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll try and tell you a few things. I wasn't actually uh, intending to be taking uh, an active role today. I found out um, <laughs> no, we, we, five we, minutes ago with the time yeah, of speaking. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but um, in, uh, yeah, just going back to the. Um, uh, the statement that the uh, LI made. I do have some history in this because uh, uh, Paul Reynolds and myself were basically the drafters 
Um, so we've been uh, we've been involved in this issue re regarding Cambodia for some years. Um, I have actually been been there once. I had um, a, a quite an adventure um, just after entering the country because I went over land border from Aranya Prefet to Poi Pet, um, which is a, only a 12-hour border. It's only open uh, seven till seven. Um, and all the buses leave for Phnom Penh and beyond, or anywhere, anywhere else in the country, before 7 o'clock. Now, if anybody's ever been anywhere near Point Pet, it's basically a, um, it's a gambling town run by gangsters. And um, uh, the only way of getting out of there, of there was to pay $200, 200 US dollars, for a seat in a taxi to take you 10 miles to the next town, where you could get the first public transport. Um, and uh, this racket was running, so I actually, I actually got out of Point Pet and got to Sisapon, hiding them in the back of a farmer's pickup truck who was, um, who was uh, carting some oranges in and out of the, the towns. So, but um, this was around about the time of the, I think it was, was it 2008, the, the election before? Yeah. Um, and um, there, were, there were election posters absolutely everywhere. And it was very clear that um, you know, there was a very strong support for, for the San Ran Si party. But there were also three or four other um, opposition parties who, who, um, who were hitting it around about 10%, eight, eight, seven, eight, nine, ten percent So even way back in 2010, uh, Hun Sen and his, um, and his ruling party were not gaining 50% um, plus of the vote. They were maybe getting 40% of the vote, but the opposition was were, were, were split between about five, five, five parties, of which sat the, the San Man Si's own party was the strongest of those opposition parties. Um, and traveling around the country, um, the, I mean, we, we went to a lot of the rural areas. We were just getting buses and uh, tuk-tuks, uh, going on the back of motos. Um, and pretty well every village, uh, what I noticed was that the ruling party's headquarters was way and way away with the biggest, the biggest building in the village. Um, there was, and, and, and it was a very, very parochial system whereby, you know, everybody, every, every, all the buildings were pretty ramshackle, but knocked together, uh, except this great big permanent structure in the middle of the village, which was the party headquarters. Um, giving the sort of idea that you actually have to be part of that to actually receive any, any benefits. So it, 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 you can see where it came from. And of course, Hun Sen himself was uh, originally a Khmer Rouge, or even though he turned against Pol Pot in the end and was installed largely by the Vietnamese. Um, and the other thing we, we, we discovered there was uh, the tension where, uh, between um, Khmer and, um, uh, and Viet Vietnamese people. Uh, there's quite a lot of tension there. But um, anyway, just going on from that, uh, I, I, I'm really here to talk about EBA and, uh, and what the Parliament's been doing. Um, e you, you, you might find it difficult to believe that uh, even with uh, EBA, uh, trying to get parliamentarians to suspend these measures and to actually vote for suspending these measures is a huge, huge challenge. Um, you, on the right, you get um, you get politicians who say, "Oh no, trade, trade, trade shouldn't be mixed up with human rights." We're having this uh, we're having this debate again now over there um, whether trade and human rights should actually be intertwined. Now, my view is it definitely should because, as far as the European Union is concerned, we only have soft power and not a big military power. And, um, and, and, and basically, that, uh, our trade is our weapon, in, in, in essence, to, to try and spread our values and to get, uh, to get some sort of order into the world, which is starting to break down. So um, we've, we've had this round just recently with the Vietnam Trade Agreement, which I was um, a shadow for, for, for the Renew Group. But um, the, even, uh, it's not just the right, if you get the left, uh, the left, uh, will always say, well, if you actually have any sanctions at all or any measures at all, it'll hurt the people. So you get the right and the left saying you shouldn't ever do anything for, different, for completely polarised uh, opposite reasons. So it's always down to the centre to say, look, if we want to, in the long term, if you want to improve the lot of the people, you actually do have to take the, the ruling classes in, these, uh, in, in anywhere to task 
and to make sure that some sort of uh, rules-based order pertains. Uh, now, the other confusion about EBA is a lot of things people, even, even the parliamentarians across there, treat it like a trade deal. But it's not, it's a contract. It's a contract. And the contract is that uh, we, will, we will give you a privilege, not a, this isn't a trade deal, it's a privilege. It's privileged uh, open access to our market without any quotas or tariffs. Um, it is, but it is not part of a trade deal. And the, the other side of the contract is that y you, you, uh, 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 you do not go backwards. You at least, you, in, in, basically you're the, the, the Cambodians and everybody else who's got EBA preferences with the EU, they are supposed to improve human rights and democracy on an ongoing basis. There's no roadmap really to uh, saying how quickly they're supposed to do this. But, uh, but basically, they're not not going backwards. Is 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 the the fundamental. So that's part of the contract. So when a when a country goes from a a multi-party democracy to a one-party state, it very very clearly breaks its contract. Now, for then the parliamentarians over there to say, oh well, you know, they've broken their contract, but we're going to continue uh, so they hadn't. Um, well, it undermines it, it undermines your whole position um, and the, the, the whole concept of the EBA uh, for everybody else in, involved. Because uh, there's, there's there's dozens of countries that got that have got EBA profit preferences, and if we give them the, the the green light to repress, to lock up the opposition, to uh, to use violence against their own people. Uh, and say, well, well, actually, we don't, you know, we, we say that you've got to improve uh, democracy and human rights, but we don't care if you actually uh, trample on them. Um, in my view, that, that's, that's almost, ne it's negligent. But the, we still have a problem getting a majority over there for actually taking any action. So I think the fact that we have actually got the, um, the, the external action service on, on side with this issue uh, is a great testament to the work we've done. Um, it's largely come from the re from the Renew Group and the, for the forerunner, Aldi. Um, and it's not only because uh, Cambodian National Rescue Party are a full member of Liberal International. It's not simply because they're a sister party. Um, it's because this is, our, this is the values that we espouse in Renew, Renew Europe and, and also in the Aldi party. That... Um, that the EU should be using its soft power to improve human rights and democracy across the world and to, and to bolster the rules-based order, which is now under threat from pretty well every, every, every angle. So um, where, where we've got to, um, I mean, going back to how Councillor Carr was um, arrested, I mean, if you, if you remember, um, it all came about when he actually announced he intended to win the election. Um, he actually said, stated, that he wanted to remove Hun Sen from post, um, obviously, clearly, through the ballot box. Uh, but the government took that, and Hun Sen himself is the government, took that as a, as a, it's this confusion of state with party. Um, you want to overthrow Hun Sen through the ballot box, that is a coup d'etat. <laughs> According to Hun Sen, He's, he, he has confused his own party with the state, with the with, with, with the state of Cambodia, and and you get you see this in many 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 cases where death box are concerned. So I think it's absolutely right that we now uh, bring to bear the sanctions that we need to bring to bear. They're not really sanctions; they are basically the suspension of rights, suspension of privileges. Sorry, the suspension the suspension of privileges because the contract has been broken. Now, um, we called in our resolution for the sp suspension of EBA rights, and we also called for uh, sanctions on specific individuals, which we've been using in Venezuela. Um, so I think this, this, the sanctioning of sp particular individuals, uh, because of um, greater control and, and harmonization across the world with the financial services that we've seen, uh, has become quite effective. I think this is a, a new tool that we've been using to some success because uh, very often with these regimes you get a, uh, a number of people who are, um, are, are using the uh, nation's wealth 
uh, to their own ends. And, and if you can target the uh, financial points along the, the line, uh, you, can actually, you can actually hit these individuals without har harming the people. So where we've got to is that um, the uh, EBA, uh, the, 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 uh, the decision has pretty well been made that EBA will be suspended, but they're holding yeah. back the, fi the um, individual sanctions for, for, for later on. Okay, okay, I think uh, just just to, to complement, uh, you know, let's say, what what is still how large is still, you know, the what other countries are part of, of the EBA and how things have been been working because uh, I I would I would like this time as Phil to give credit to the to the EU and EU External Action Service. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they have been following the situation in Cambodia and, the, and in the country very much. Of course, and the push by the European Parliament has, has been very in, in important. But in November, just some weeks before our, our we talk ELI uh, uh, language, the, the Commission uh, finalized a, a report on temporary suspension uh, of of these preferences that we were talking, you were talking about, and we know that in the total uh, amount of exports to the European Union from countries enjoying this Cambodia's part is very very large. We are talking about an export that is actually uh, some uh, Cambodia is exporting to European Union countries last uh, 2018 over five, bi five billion, worth five billion euros. And of that, 70% clothing and textiles. So be careful when you buy textiles, I would, I would say. <laughs> but, but, the, but, but the question, as, as Phil has been, been raising, you know, we know this textile, textile work, that's something that is moving around very, very easy. Will, who, we could also ask more, who are owning these factories? Who, who is gaining from, from, from these factories, from the, this? Are the working conditions acceptable? How are the European country textile import, are they following what is happening in, in, in Cambodia? Like if I go to, um, I obviously have three these friends here, so I cannot age at M. Do they have factories in, in Cambodia? Can we do also something as, as con, con, consumers? But, but this is interesting what, what, you, sa what you said about you know, the difficulties in the European Parliament. Uh, I want to make a little bit of an apology also for the European Union because there are new studies saying that the competition policy uh, is better in the European Union because of we having a commission that is independent in making its decision. Of course, they have also had a liberal commissioner uh, respond. But this, I think that, that the important here is now, first, that the commission uh, must now make a ruling after their temporary suspension. What has been the answer uh, of, of the government? And maybe you know a little bit about the answers of the government take away these preferences for the import of, of clothing and, and, and other things. So I, would, I think Phil knows and I think we have the feeling that if we would bet it something, Commission is going to react in some way. Their decision, I think so, or the, uh, but, but I think so, but, but what <coughs> if they have reacted once? What, what tools do their rest then if, if, you know, through different ways, Hun Sen is not react. I think this is also something you need to reflect on when you take the decisions. It's a little bit like in a process, uh, how it really, can, can, the revo can, can there be such a situation that, we, that EU could still continue to press uh, the government uh, to do more? Uh, and what is the best option here to have full suspension of all privileges or to have partial to stay in dialogue? 
I think this is this is yeah. and and do you also support uh, what Phil is saying? Personal sanctions like like uh, the financial. I mean, not to have visas here and the financial implications. Things that we have that the European yeah. Union Pretty has exactly. done quite much regarding uh, Russia, Crimea, this situation. What what are the tools? Uh, that you think European Union should, uh, and how should we evaluate what has happened since the temporary suspension? In the beginning of the year 2000, the uh, European Union evaluated um, the situation of Cambodia, economic situation. And the, everything but on, well, without, uh, ta uh, without tariff, Everything that is produced in Cambodia can be sold in the at the EU market without tariff except arms. Okay, the objective is to help a country like Cambodia with die-hard um, poverty to allow those people in poverty to make to come out of poverty. And who what, who are we talking about in Cambodia? The level of poverty, people making. Uh, less than now two dollars more than a, a, a euro, one euro a day. Uh, uh, it's about four million people. Okay. Another four million people are making just above the um, poverty line. Eight million out of sixteen million, and that's why EPA uh, everything but arms tariff-free pref uh, preference trade preference was given to Cambodia. Yes, Cambodia has been able to, uh, especially the workers, 700,000 workers, mainly women, from the rural areas, the poorest of the poor, have been able to improve their lives, meaning that they are able to support themselves, they are able to um, support at least four other members of the families. That's why I count, it's not just 700,000, we're talking about three million people. Because all the small economy benefits from the, the, um, uh, the workers who buy food, clothing, what, and so on. If, and who owns these factories? 50% are owned by the Chinese. The other, the rest, Japanese, Taiwanese, Koreans, in the region. But they are factory owners, but the brands are global. H&M is one of the, the biggest. Nike, Gap, uh, Banana Republic, we're making shoes. We also make uh, and um, bags and suitcases. You name it. We also make bicycles, and most of the bicycles that are sold in in the EU are made in Cambodia. Yeah. How about the European Parliament? Right. Uh, so you know the European Parliament has now uh, for. Bikes also for the MEPs, so maybe we must check that. Oh, made in Cambodia. I, I never found mine. <laughs> <laughs> now, on the 12th of February, which is one week exactly from today, it will be announced, the EU will announce how they will, from our visit this time, it sounds like there will be some form of a, a partial withdrawal. How partial is partial? It's not partial whether that makes a difference or not. It's at the end of the day, uh, the EU, what the EU wants is to stay engaged with the dictator. The, the EU engaging with the dictator, a Hun Sen that has not wanted, that has not been able to trans be transformed for the past 34 years, the EU wants to stay engaged, okay, stay engaged. But at the same time, thanks to 
people like you who come to these discussions, thanks to the MEPs, thanks to the, the, the independent media, thanks to our diaspora, thanks to social media, we do not let the violations of human rights uh, go unnoticed. Yeah. It's posted, it's discussed, it's, you name it, you shame it, you report it, and that brought the, uh, that has, that's why the, the commission has had a really good report of and the graph of the situation of human rights in Cambodia. Now, let's say it's partial but big enough so that um, Hun Sen will say, hmm, I should consider. But will he consider enough to immediately drop all charges against our president who goes to court every day? Will he consider enough to let the civil society, the human rights defenders, to let the independent uh, media go back to Cambodia? Will he consider enough to let us who are in exile go back so that we can start think of preparing for the next election, a local election in 2022 and general election in 2023? We have to go back there. Okay, will all each be from what we hear, he will have, Sen will have to consider a lot to, for the EU to reconsider. Yeah. But by the 12th of February, when it is announced, then it, will, it is a law, it's not a statement. It's not a position, it's a law, because it has to come and be passed by the parliament again. And then that means in, but it takes another six months until August for that law to be implemented, for that law, for the tariffs to be imposed on the goods from Cambodia. By the way, $700 million a year that Cambodia can benefit in terms of tariff from the EU market. Without that, Cambodia will lose $700 million a year. Yeah, to pay the tariffs. Now, Mr. Hun Sen, until now, the EU has given Mr. Hun Sen 12 months to respond. He has responded in his way by releasing some of our, the prisoners, by releasing the human rights activists, by getting Mr. Gomsokha out of prison, but an, house arrest, things like that, but that is not, surely not enough. And we are really, really grateful again to the MEPs for your resolution. We are grateful for uh, all, of, all who have been involved in the Cambodia issue. Now, this, what do we want? The balance between work, keeping the 700,000 women men and the farmer will work with income on a daily basis or nothing at all. That's the dilemma with the EU, the Commission. It's a dilemma for us too. But to us, we are saying, do we want our workers, do we want our people to be living with Hun Sen for the, another 34 years? Or do we want democracy now? Now meaning we can go back, we can start working, be on the ground, have a compromise somewhere so that we can put democracy on track. So I would say, do you say totally cut it off Personally, I would not agree with it, 100% withdrawal. I agree with giving Hun Sen a little bit more time, but more is not another six years, another 10 years. We're talking about weeks and months, days, weeks and months. We're not talking about years, yeah? So that we can come to a point where Slowly, slowly, we can go back, our people can come out of jail, we can talk together as a people, have work toward national reconciliation, 
and really set the ground for long-term democracy. But first, free and fair election, long-term democracy, power to the people, respect the human rights of the people, and set Cambodia on the right track once and for all. Yeah, I think there's, um, uh, I, I would support uh, Lou in saying that we should have a partial withdrawal. Uh, and a partial withdrawal that you can step up or draw back from um, as, 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 the, as the situation progresses. Um, I mean, the, um, all of the imprisonments and the banning of the uh, party were, were largely timed um, such that no party, other party could form in, in the period before the general election. So when the general election did take place, um, there was no opposition, basically. There was only one party standing. So we have a one party state. Uh, I think it's also relevant to note that, uh, that Hun Sen has a long-term project to tie himself to China, which has actually been, um, um, it, which, which he's, he's building up at the moment. Uh, even, even when I went there uh, uh, 11 years, 12 years ago, there was a, uh, uh, a, uh, you could see that uh, there were areas of land that um, simply didn't have any peasant farmers left on there. That the, the, there's been there's been land grabs, land clearances, and a lot of this land has been deployed by the Chinese uh, to export food into China, and it's run by the Chinese. Uh, and basically, Hun Sen gets a payoff. It's the same with the um, the resorts, you see Newtonville and places like that. Uh, pretty well, all the hotels and everything are run by the Chinese, and uh, the government gets a gets a gets a slice. Um, and uh, I, I, I've also been taking on the Chinese in my human rights work because we nominated uh, um, uh, Il Ilhan Tohti for the Sakharov Prize successfully, and I got drawn in by the Chinese uh, embassy to uh, to explain myself. They asked me to withdraw the nomination. But, um, and, and I'd also had to go at them about the South China Sea, about the, uh, about the Tibetans, uh, about um, Taiwan, oh God, but I can't remember how many other things. I had to explain to them that I wasn't, it, was, it wasn't only the Chinese I was having a go at. I said, look how I've been putting pressure on Cambodia. And said, but I was actually being quite mischievous because I knew that they were actually the ones that were propping up Hun Sen with their with their payments. Also with with Xi Jinping's, um, it fits into his geopolitical strategy of, of being the opponent of democracy and uh, and, and a sort of uh, trying to create a uh, an authenticity behind uh, behind the despot. You know this is as a as a legitimate alternative framework. So so Cambodia is also a Chinese project or a Xi Jinping project in a sense. Um, and they they use a lot of cash to keep the uh, uh, keep keep the government in power there. So um, it, it's quite seeing um, a government which is unpopular but has actually managed to retain power even by legitimate means originally. Um, you can actually trace that back uh, to the support they're getting from China and. Uh, um, and really, they've just sold off the country's assets to the Chinese and uh, are living off a sort of uh, uh, rake-offs from it, which is uh, uh, really, really quite disturbing. And on the, 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 the textile industry is actually very mobile. Um, I got involved with this before with the Rana Plaza collapse. Um, I was the rapporteur and uh, the uh, author of all the resolutions that went through the European Parliament with the Rana Plaza collapse in Dakar. And, uh, even then, the Bangladeshis were very, very, very worried, and, and we put pressure on them through the uh, through the trade commissioner at the time, who was Carol de Gux at the time, um, and we and, and they were threatened with the withdrawal of EBA um, uh, on the same um, and and all, all trade GSP plus trade preferences. Um, they were threatened. They weren't threatened openly. They were. It was an under the uh, under the counter sort of threat. They were just with. They were just told at diplomatic level that if they didn't sort sort it out, but at that time we also went through the uh, the, the the commission the buyers like uh, Benetton and Primark etc. Uh, but what we found is this trade is extremely mobile, and, and where Bangladesh was then losing it, Cambodia and Vietnam were gaining it. Uh, previously, Bangladesh gained it 
when the uh, power situation in Karachi was so bad that the uh, half the time the factories haven't got any electricity. So uh, they all decamped from Karachi to Dakar. Um, now we've run a plaza a lot of them moved over to Vietnam, and Vietnam would be probably the main beneficiary if uh, if um, the if the factories wanted to move from Cambodia to avoid the tariffs. They'll probably all, all, all end up in Vietnam somewhere. So it's extra, they can do this very very quickly. It's uh, in a matter of um, a few months, they can move from move the production from one country to another, and then they're generally they're not owned. The factories are not owned by the big chains. They're, the cha they just buy them on the open market. They have contracts with them though, and we have been pushing from this end to get better uh, conditions, uh, ILO conditions, and better pay uh, and better factory safety. We, we worked on inspectorates, so there is a a big push and quite a successful push from the European end to actually improve the uh, conditions in the factories. Okay. Uh, yeah, just one last point. Yeah. Uh, for all my efforts with uh, Cambodia, Hun Sen, in, in a fit of temper, actually banned me from Cambodia as well. So, uh, uh, like Mu, I'm not allowed to go to Cambodia either. Um, although the External Action Service say that he now says it was a mistake, but he hasn't actually formally rescinded the ban. Um, I only found out about this ban when one of my constituents saw a poster of Phnom Penh Airport as it was leaving, saying that I was, if, if I was seen entering the uh, airport, the authorities had got to turn me back. So uh, uh, this is the sort of person he is. I mean, um, uh, Rancy tells me, oh, he, he's very hot-headed. He just, uh, he, he blows up, has a big temper tantrum, and all of these sort of things happen. He's very impulsive in that way. So. Let's hope he can be impulsive in, in, a, in another way uh, and actually make an impulsive decision to, uh, to toe the line, which uh, is, is not impossible. And I think we should can just carry on putting the pressure on. Okay, thanks. thanks. Now I think it's time to let in the audience to put, to yes. put questions. We, uh, so if uh, uh, we, ha we have an extra, an extra mic there, you can go, go around. Uh, Put, put questions to, to, to Phil, to, to Mo, or, or to us as other about what is the what are what are what is your evaluation uh, um, of the measures to be to be taken? Are there other actions that we should uh, uh, raise, like in the United Nations? Uh, there has been also mentioned that uh, the EU. Uh, are, Asian uh, meeting, the ASEM is going to take place 2020 uh, in uh, Cambodia, in Phnom Penh as well. Are there some things that could be done in view, view of that? Uh, the floor is, is, is open for comments and questions. Hello. Uh, alors, alors, non, 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 alors, on peut aussi poser des questions, euh, questions en français, si vous, si vous voulez, si ça vous convient mm -hmm. plus. Mais maintenant, euh, commence Orsa. Now, Orsa, you can introduce yourself. Yes, yes. hello, uh, my name is Orsa. <coughs> Orsa Nilsson Sjöldersund. I'm from the Liberal Party in Sweden. Uh, I know Sweden is a big donor to, to Cambodia, and also other European countries give a lot of development aid to, to the country. So I would like to know how would you, Mosofia, like to like for us to act with the development aid? Should we cut it? Should we uh, put criteria to it? Should we direct it to certain sectors? What are the what would be the best way to act to support democracy? I would be very. I am very clear. I'm very clear again. Uh, going back, I would not rule out uh, total withdrawal. I said partial engagement. I would not rule out total withdrawal. Okay? Yeah. It, it comes to a point where, and I'm not talking about years, I'm talking about months, in the next few, few weeks, few months, if Hun Sen just refuses to make any move to improve the human rights situation in Cambodia, and uh, the repression becomes worse, then I would come back to EU again and say the situation is good. Okay? 
Again, we are not targeting the people. We are targeting the regime of Mr. Hun Sen. We are targeting the dictatorship, the dictator, okay? Without punishing the people. Therefore, is assistance such as health, education, agriculture, all these things, civil society, uh, that do not go to, through the government, you should continue. However, the government is very smart. Now, with the uh, NGO law, they are putting restrictions on the NGOs to report on the resources of their funds so that they can put pressure on the civil so and the NGOs, the civil society. Then, they're in the directly or indirectly, the government itself, Mr. Hun Sen itself, is still punishing the, the people. We say, and your governments have been listening, no direct aid to support the government. Zero. Sweden has been helpful in the decentralization program, Germany also, but it goes directly to, come to the government. All aid to the government of Mr. Hun Sen, the regime of Mr. Hun Sen must stop. Sanctions, visa sanctions, against targeting Mr. Hun Sen, his family, the officials, high-ranking officials, who have been known to be involved in deforestation, in corruption, in uh, human trafficking, in violations of human rights, in um, trade of illegal timber, should be on your blacklist. Visa sanctions and assets sanctions. Still, you don't have a job at the EU, but now you have a job in the UK, your country, talk, work with us on visa sanctions. Um, and every country, Sweden, Finland, every country, uh, although you're part of the EU, but as your own, as member states, you can uh, work on visa sanctions individually. And we ask you to talk to your MPs, talk to your national MPs, and talk to your government to work with us on visa sanctions and asset sanctions. Yeah. UK, we know that the niece of Mr. Hun Sen has an apartment in London at High Park costing $5 million, and she goes around in a jet, private jet, uh, Orient Express, and her bags cost $10,000 per bag she bought 10 bags. And she's on Instagram, on Facebook, and for where does the money come from? Yeah. From the sweat, from the lives, from the, from the lives of our people. Therefore, she should be targeted for um, assets freezing. Yeah. Be very specific. You, yeah, you can do that, you can name, you can shame, you can call out their names you don't have. Please stop rolling red carpet for Mr. Hun Sen and the high-ranking officials. They do, they still come to your cities, your capital cities. Don't roll out your red carpets. In fact, don't invite them to your, to your, to, to your capitals, period. Yeah. Right, be specific. Uh, please, there, uh, yeah, well, this man might can be there. And yeah. Just a very quick one. I think it's uh, always very difficult to get in, um, the British government to take uh, these issues seriously. Um, London is the centre now of whether it's the Russian mafia, whether it's uh, money coming from Venezuelan oil or whatever. Um, all of the oligarchs in the world have pads in, in, in Knightsbridge. Um, and uh, we now have a new government in the UK who is, uh, uh, if they have a brand at all, it's, it's a contempt for the opposition. And uh, um, the, so far, they have completely refused to answer any of our questions. Uh, they're just pretending we don't exist. It's actually quite an unpleasant uh, atmosphere in the UK at the moment. But when things settle down, uh, hopefully we'll try and take this on. But uh, the other thing was, uh, uh, on the issue of uh, direct 
aid or direct aid to governments is another thing where the UK is absolutely hopeless. They, they like propping up governments and let, they, on the idea that basically that is allowing the government to, to spend the money as they feel fit, not um, as the British government feels fit. fit. But uh, I got involved with this argument about 30, 30 years ago with, uh, when, when um, I had to, uh, it was at a symposium run by Christian Aid. And uh, their point was that uh, 50 to 60 percent of the cash that goes through governments before it actually gets used at the uh, uh, at the front line, uh, around about 50 to 50 to 60 percent of it gets raked off in in corruption, one way or another. Uh, so it is better actually to to direct aid through NGOs, especially particularly, but they have to be trusted NGOs and the ones that you can you know actually do the job uh, and are not wasteful because NGOs have become very, very expert now on, on, on um, spending all their money on their own lobbyists and, uh, and on their own campaigns rather than actually at the, at, at, at the front line where it's needed. Please, the floor is over. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Frederick Parman and I'm a trainee at the German representation. It's more uh, like a personal question right now uh, and more addressing the EU and its possibilities to shape the situation. So my question would be, if it's really feasible to put pressure on countries like Cambodia, so like countries in this specific region of the world, as we see with Chinese economic foreign policy at the moment, so that do we really think that it's possible to, for example, cut off the privileges to a certain extent that really hurts, because then we would know that it's like it gives more space for um, the Chinese foreign policy to enter in, into this um, yeah space. space left blank. Yeah. So is there really a leverage possible in this respect? And the second question is that you mentioned um, how the garment industry is working and that it's really difficult because it's moving around and that yeah. we always have this problem with the human rights situation. So if on the long term, it's not uh, an option to kind of um, create a demand for fair produce yeah, yeah, things so that we just say, okay, we make restrictions in the EU and you yeah. can only export to the European Union if the human rights situation yeah. is a certain. And then there is also, um, yeah, then countries will, there is a demand for fair produced um, garment and then there, there will be also a production of such garments. Yeah. Okay. I'll go first on this because yeah, I think I'm, okay. yeah. Yeah. I think you made the end of me. Yeah. But uh, the, the answer is yes, there is a risk on, on the first question. Um, but uh, don't underestimate the level of wealth that we have compared with China in terms of uh, the, the, you might get Belt and Road loans, you might get um, buying up of the, of the assets uh, you might get Chinese business men running hotels, but um, the the level the, the, the level of the exports of the of that of the garment trade, which is uh, fairly well established in, in it's well established in Cambodia, has been for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, the 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 revenues going back to Cambodia from that because it's coming from a rich Western country. Uh, I think Hun Sen actually imagines that he can replace this with China. But he's he's being over optimistic in in terms of how much China can can actually uh, prop him up financially and, and, and economically. Um, but the, and also we don't underestimate how effective now that these financial sanctions, these freezing of bank accounts, you suddenly find out your your bank accounts are all frozen. But remember, Hong Kong has equivalents with uh, EU equivalents. Singapore has EU equivalents, and New York, New York. So all the big financial centers, centers are very, very connected now in that they have equivalents from the, from, from the United States, from the EU, from the big, big well, players. Can you explain equivalents? Sir? Well, basically it means you can trade, you can do financial trades, uh, and banking through those centers uh, without any extra regulation, uh, because the regulations have been approved as, as, be, as being roughly equivalent 
uh, on a global level. So, so basically, you, you, you are left only, uh, you're really stranded outside of the world banking system. Um, and can be very, when you get your bank account closed under these, these sanctions. So it, it, it becomes extremely difficult. And the, 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 the young lady buying her Prada bags or whatever she will suddenly find out her credit card doesn't work. Uh, and you know, this, is, this really works. This is one of the most effective things. So don't underestimate uh, how, how much power we still have. But uh, we're, still, we're only just learning how to use it. Um, and, and this, this, this uh, phenomenon we're seeing from Xi Jinping, Modi, the rest of them, Putin, uh, uh, trying to upset the, the rules-based order is a fairly recent phenomenon. And uh, we've been slow to react. But we're starting to learn how to react to it. It's, it but we have been very slow. Uh, what was the, the second question was on, um, um, the mobility. on the mobility of the garment industry. Oh, yeah, yes. Well, yeah, oh, of course, yes. I mean, that's working. That's exactly what we've been doing. Uh, looking for um, um, the companies themselves to use um, uh, their own standards to sell their products as being ethical. It's exactly how we've gone along the line. And, um, that, and the, the EU has actually... Uh, to a small extent, put in some legislation. I don't think you should really legislate too strong because basically these are um, selling points. If, it's, if everybody has the same selling point, it makes it difficult. But we are seeing this, and we are saying that you have to meet ILO standards, and etc., etc., etc. And we've made massive progress with this. It, it's uh, it, it, massive progress over the last 20 years, and it's still going on. But, but, but still, I think because we know that one of the human rights priorities of really Nauman Foundation is business and human rights. Maybe two, two months or somebody from the office would like to come into that because I think we know it's traceability is a very, very difficult question here. But I think traceability will increase. And as to the financial assets, uh, there are interesting examples of how uh, assets of the daughter uh, Karimova in Uzbekistan was freezed by because of U.S. actions, and the U.S. Uh, sanctions have also they are very very going very very deep. As soon as you have some small connection, they might also freeze. So, fr asset freeze is really really a workable workable thing. And as as you, I, I also I mean we need to work with the with the garment industry and to make them aware if this happens. You know that that is yeah. also yes. very. Yeah. Very, very, very clear. And let's say that we can also compare the sanctions, uh, personal sanctions, uh, in uh, regarding, uh, uh, you know, uh, Russia. There's there are large misconceptions what has worked and what has not not. And especially, uh, I think that there are sanctions and counter, counter sanctions that the Russians have have put, have put in. But we can see that they are affecting the financial cell sector now, the sanctions uh, de facto, and it's di more difficult for uh, Russian companies to, to get credits and things. They are, they, so they are, to a certain extent, might, they might be more dependent on, on, on the state, but the, sta the resources are depleted at that stage. But I think it's important also, you know, to stay in, the, in, in kind of, the, you know, not give up all cards at once okay. as a poker player. Absolutely. I think that, that is maybe yeah. the picture I would, I would like to, to use here. More questions uh, from, from the floor. Plus de questions? Encore de questions? Thomas. Yes, uh, I, I have a question which uh, goes back to what has um, Busocha said uh, on the path uh, to more democracy. So uh, let's assume um, the uh, decision of the <coughs> European Union uh, will be like that, that we have a partial uh, suspension. Um, what are your next uh, steps to make sure that you uh, don't end up uh, in, a, in a deadlock or in, in kind of, uh, well, uh, prolongation of the Hun Sen system that he simply says, okay, fine, it's, uh, if the EU does not like me, I will face 100% uh, towards China and forget about the opposition. So what is your next uh, assumption on political steps on uh, how to, uh, to, to build that path you were talking about? Mr. Bosocha, you want 
Jonathan Sen is, as you know, is very clever to uh, play with the time frame of the EU so far, the 12 months, another six months before it can get, it, it, it will be implemented. So he's playing around. So during the first the 12 months now, he's been trying to divide the opposition. So some of us are outside and some are inside. So he's trying to, to put a barrier and he has not been able to break the opposition, divide us. We are inside, outside, very committed to change, to demo to for democracy. Change, change, change. His first uh, mistake. Second mistake, he was hoping to divide the EU because he was lobbying Poland, Hungary. He was uh, um, going to also um, um, uh, Bulgaria, all these countries supposed to be friendly, they did not uh, um, satisfy his needs. And then now China is very preoccupied with coronavirus. China has had to pump in over 100 billion, more than 100 billion dollars into its own economy and very worried about the situation. Hun Sen is now is desperately saying he has mishandled the coronavirus so badly. First he said, no, I will not bring the 23 Cambodian students who are in Wuhan back to Cambodia because we have to stay with our friend, China, in good times and in bad times. He was blasted on Facebook. He turned around quickly, he said, don't misunderstand me, I will go to China now. If China allows me to go, I will go. Got blasted again, I sent a note uh, yesterday. The lives of your people, the lives of your students, the lives of people, uh, your, your in, uh, accountability to the global community you are not responding to that, forget it. So let, his, let the dictator make his own mistakes over and over and over. This is when you grab him, see, put your card on the table, and that's what I, we told the EU Commission yesterday. So don't deal, you're not dealing with the government of Cambodia. You are dealing with a person, one person, and you are dealing with a dictator. Yeah, there are many ways to deal with a dictator. We stand clear on one side, the human rights of our people. Human rights of global human rights. Democracy is the only way to put Cambodia back on track and rebuild Cambodia. We have lost 70% of our forest. We will never get the forest back. But we can stop China. Because China is not, in Cambodia, has a past genocide. Genocide in Cambodia was totally backed by China. Therefore, the people of Cambodia when we talk, when Hun Sen wants to sell China to the people of Cambodia, we say to him, I lost, I lost my parents. We all, we, you lost your child. No China. The way you want, because it's for your power. It's not for the benefit of the people of Cambodia. And we are very clear on that. And we are winning. We are totally winning. But we also want the EU to fulfill the, its commitment against the strong, very strong, the US as well. We, we are advocating, and again, I acknowledge the presence, I acknowledge the hard work of our citizens, of our, Cambodia, of our Cambodian friends and colleagues outside of, of uh, Cambodia. The diaspora is strong, 
uh, monks, venerable you know, monks, you know, Ganath Twinkle Pitchkun. Very important to link, to keep the hope and that flight. I've been on the road for three, two years. I am boarding the flight tomorrow, the, the train tomorrow, then the flight to Paris and then flight to I don't know where. Tomorrow, after tomorrow, I don't know where to stay. I'm going to be staying. I have a suitcase. I don't know where I'm going to be staying. But that's not the point. The point is, I, saw, I want to show you something. We have not given up hope. The strength is the hope. The strength is the commitment to bring change for our people on the ground. May I yes. see my presentation again? I, with some colleagues, and I invite you to join me, join us in um, supporting the Cambodia, the Courage Fund, the Cambodia Courage Fund. These are people I spoke earlier of people who were who have been arrested, who are arrested, who are still in, in detention, or who are in exile. What do we do for them? The government is not doing anything. The NGOs are not doing anything. The multilateral are not doing anything because most of the, all of them are so-called opposition, labeled by Hun Sen as terrorist. He is a senator. So those who have been targeted, have been targeted, have gone to prison, that means these are people who are in, that's their, the uniform, yeah? Human rights activists, senators, youth leaders, young youth, I mean young um, activists, youth, in jail. Uh, who, who has, how can I hit the arrows? Yes. The so I found that the Courage Fund Cambodia, the goal is to, to raise awareness. Every single day, those who are labeled as opposition can be arrested without warrant, arrest warrant, can be beaten, can be frightened, can be raped every day, every day, anyway, anywhere in Cambodia. It's, and we report, and we continue to report, thank to also to the Office of the uh, High Commissioner on Human Rights, the UN High Commissioner on, on Human Rights, and to Human Rights NGO in Cambodia. They are, these cases are being <coughs> recorded. Five, the 5,000 who were elected in 2017 are under civilian. Even if they plow their field, they are watched by the media chief. Even if they sit like together to have coffee or to have a meal, they could be arrested. They are called the terrorist organizing uh, meeting to overthrow the government. That is so extreme. Very brutal, brutal how they handle of people and they are making us as the enemy of the state, the enemy of Hun Sen, actually. This, this person was, is a member of parliament, beaten by the gangsters. These are bodyguards of Mr. Hun Sen. Where? In front of the National Assembly. Members of parliament, injured, and um, one of his, he can't hear from one of his Yes. Just to show that we don't give up. On our side, what we can do, we can do raise awareness, we can create foundations, we can help them have a voice. They were with me at uh, Freedom Park in 2014. They were arrested put in jail for four years, I was released two weeks later. I was also in jail. These are the children, these are the families. 
totally frightened inside Cambodia. When their, when their husbands are detained, even before the detention, you, the family knows because the village chief, the police in the commune will, war, will roam around the, ho the house and you know the next day the her husband or even the wife, the mother, will be taken. It's so much like the Khmer Rouge years. They are what they call, we call the pineapple ears, the pineapple eyes. You know pineapples have these little marks, they are the eyes. And we call them the pineapple eyes, the village chiefs or the police the authorities, they spy on us, like during the Khmer Rouge years. We will <coughs> never forget. And we have, what do we do? We visit them, we visit right away, we uh, send the money, we make sure that uh, they are visited by a lawyer, we make sure that they are visited in jail, we make sure that the families are safe. And some, for some of them, 75% yes we can reach, the other 25 we can't reach because they don't have phone, telephone, or they are still being watched and they say stay away from us. So the staff, there are only two people working paid uh, in this organization's foundation. Um, they are also um, political prisoners. This foundation is only for political prisoners and activists who are labeled as, uh, no, this is for my pres presentation later. Um, so this is to say that we have to be resourceful, and we are. And we ask you to um, support the foundation if you know if any other foundations can, that can contribute uh, the funds to support us, uh, we would very much uh, welcome and get the words going. I, uh, I have submitted, uh, we go beyond our political, the political prisoners. We, I have submitted a report uh, to uh, Astrid on torture because when we are no longer inside Cambodia, there is no other opposition. No one will speak, no one dares to speak. And these brutalities, these great violations of human rights still go on inside Cambodia and we have to keep on working inside and outside of Cambodia. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, dear, dear Mo, thank you for this very important information. There's just one thing we lack. Uh, is there a web page where we can follow uh, what the foundation is, is doing? I think that should be uh, coming up now here yes. to, to see how, how we can do. And uh, do also, I mean, both to support the foundation and to follow things what is written around, uh, uh, around the, the, the world about the situation. And finally, I think we also need a little bit of context in order to, to campaign in the countries we are exactly for the visa and asset freezes that we were talking about. That is some very, very important information that we, that we need. Uh, I now, you have now the final uh, moment to, uh, to ask for the floor uh, before, before we close it. Uh, otherwise, we will, if, no, if nobody is requesting, there's al also, of course, the possibility then to talk to, to Phil and to Mo and to us others a little bit more in, in confidence if you want also to, to do that. I think that is as well important at occasions like, like this. Yeah, yes, Joshua. Hello, um, <coughs> my name is Joshua. I'm a, I have a scholarship at the Fries Norman Foundation. I'm a student. And uh, I would like to know by you, what do you think are the prospects for Cambodia? Because as you say, the system is completely oppressing the opposition, the parties underground, the dictator has established his power in, in almost all aspects of this uh, society. So how, how do you think this can be can be broken in the long term? Where do you see hope for, for a change in Cambodia? Uh, and quietly, I also will ask more, what are the ways, I think there must be some kind of mediation and some kind of thing that we must assure from our side uh, how, how a transition could go about, yeah. because we have seen similar situations in Venezuela, and where, where we know that the discussions between the 
the, the, the de facto rule as a dictator and the opposition has, has broken down. What have we learned from this situation, for the situation of Cambodia? No, we are very, it's a very good question, Joshua. We are very, very careful. Remember I said that in 2015, we, we um, rejected the results of the election and we didn't take the seats, the 55 seats, we didn't take them right away. We were in the streets for half a year. There were sometimes close to half a million people. What we saw in Hong Kong, what we see in Hong Kong, was what we had in Cambodia. But at that time, although we had the people in the streets, we so strongly believed in non-violence that we didn't occupy any government uh, buildings. We didn't call, we didn't use violence at all. We were just going marching and marching. And we made a strategic mistake then because we believed so strongly in non-violence. We were not prepared for this type of people coming out and joining us in big protests. Uh, we didn't make use of it um, in a way so that we could transform it into a move, a transition to democracy. Um, now we, we are more careful how to move from dictatorship to democracy. We have been lobbying like this for over two years. Are we still going to go for another two years, 20 years for that? No way. Um, we, the move is how to go back home. Uh, we continue to work very hard with our diaspora. We continue to keep the voice of the opposition strong without feeling divided, although they try every single way they can to divide us with fake news, with all sorts of things, yeah? Uh, so we have every single one of us need to be very uh, uh, active. We are putting training programs into our, uh, into our party. From now, from here, I go to Boston to go with the women's movement, to train the women, and then we will sit down for strategic planning. Uh, we will seek your advice, we will seek, uh, we will look at other cases in the world so that from, okay, let's say we go home and we win the next election, Hun Sen can take it away from us again. Well, you know, we're not gonna let that happen. So from now until 2023, how do we make sure that every single investment we put in is an investment that will benefit long-term democracy? I can't be specific because it's open, <laughs> but I can tell you this is the road map. Okay. Now, that was the final question. Uh, we thank you, we thank FNF very much for, for hosting us, all of you who are, are here, uh, Finn, and especially Mo. You know, we are standing with you. Yeah. You know, we try to do everything we can. <laughs> all, all the best, and applause is to you. stream I would say special thanks to Frederick Norman Foundation inside